silently acknowledge. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to silently acknowledge your presence and ask for your help. As we begin this meeting, help us to feel your spirit and follow the promptings you give us for things we should do or say. Help us to engage in meaningful discussions and dialogue and to make the best decision for our training. We are so grateful for our friends who are yet to join and those who have joined. We are also grateful for the life of the person who is about to teach us. Help us to strengthen one another and lift your name in the work we do. Father, we seek your wisdom and inspiration as we meet together to discuss on our journalism training. Please continue to bless us as we seek to fulfill our divine potential. And please help us to be patient and kind with one another as we learn from each other. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So without wasting much time, I will give a brief bio of the speaker and I invite him to come and present to us. So Mr. Isaac. Ophir J is a research and data analyst with the multimedia group MGL, but stationed at Joy News and Joy Event. He is actually with one of our own with a degree in statistics and economics from the University of Ghana. He also holds a professional certificate in effective data storytelling from the Ghana Institute of Journalism, GI. Partnership with the Ghana Sascal Service and UNB. Isaac was the lead data analyst for Joy News Joy FM during the 2020 general election that carried out data driven coverage during elections. He's gone ahead to lead other projects with the ambit for the solid brand. His, his, his current role with Joy News Joy FM. Team is to help with both on air and off air data analysis and visualization, fact checking, and conducting surveys by certain key CSO. You can find most of the data at post on myjournaline.com. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like all of us to welcome our speaker today. Isaac for PhD. Welcome, Mr. Isaac. Welcome, Mr. Isaac. Hi, hello. I hope you can all hear me. Yes, please. Yes. Oh, okay. So I think for the sake of you know convenience, I would like to be referred to as you can just call me Kofi or Isaac. I'm I'm cool with it. So the mister makes me look like I'm married, so but I'm not. So. All right. So um Ekia, thank you so much for the introduction. Please can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. You are welcome. All right. So I'll share my screen so we you know we kick starts. Uh, is my screen visible now? Yeah. Yes, it's visible. Okay. So just like Ikea said, I simply put my name is Isaac Kofi AJ, and I'm one of you. One of you simply means I also pass through the um, statistics department, Department of Statistics and Actuarial Science. I was also at the Mass and you know Economics Department, but I majored in Stats and Economics. So, yeah. So, um, pick one on Twitter. You can actually follow me um, with the 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 handle you see here uh, that's Isaac Kofia J at Isaac Kofia J on Twitter. You can follow me if you are interested in you know data journalism, interested in figures, interested in data visualization, data analysis, 
and news, which is data packed. You can actually follow me on Twitter using this handle. And then also you can reach me on LinkedIn by using um, Isaac, just type in Isaac Kofi J on LinkedIn. You can find me over there. And if you want to reach me personally, you can also send me a mail um, via Isaac Kofi AJ, Isaac.aj at myjoyonline.com, Isaac.aj at myjoyonline.com. So you can reach me personally, you know, um, using uh, that these three means on Twitter, um, LinkedIn, very important, and then also uh, via mail, which is Isaac.aj at myjoyonline.com. So for those of us who just joined, this is going to be a very simple training. And then anything I will do here will not be exhaustive, meaning this will not be like the universal set or this will not be all. It simply means that I'm just going to give a, a simple overview of what, what we call data journalism, of which I have the privilege to be you know, speaking to you about, about it this evening. And I, I want us to feel free in this training session because I, I feel I'm one of you. Yeah. So if you have any question, you can ask me. If you want clarity, feel free to ask. And then if you want to question me on something I say to, you know, you are free to actually question me because it is my duty to explain to you what data journalism is. All right. So moving away from that, uh, let's look at, initially I wanted us to do this uh, training in two phases. Um, phase one was going to look at data journalism and then the phase two was going to look at fact checking, which is really, really important, you know. But as it stands now, I saw a notification that says, if you join to this class, there's no need for you to join tomorrow's class. So it means I have to find a way to, you know, lump the two together. That is the data journalism and then fact checking because the two of them, though they complement each other but on the field, it can be a little bit, uh, you know, different. So today um, we have about um, five outlines that we want to, you know, uh, make sure we have an idea of. So first look at what is data journalism and who is a data journalist. And then secondly, we'll look at the importance of data in journalism. And then we'll also talk about how do I start my journey as a data journalist or a journal. Simply the short form of a journalist is, can be referred to as a journal. And then we also look at data journalism, some of the two packs you need as a data journalist. And then I'll share with you some of my work uh, that I've done, and that will be the practical session of this whole training. So if you just joined, we are not doing rocket science here. All we are doing is to teach ourselves what we call data journalism. It's more or less like a new kid on the block in Ghana. It's been existing elsewhere, but in Ghana, it's more or less like the new kid on the block. On which block? On the block of journalism. I don't know if we have um, a variety of, you know, uh, department joining, but I know most of you here are from the statistics department and natural science. And so you ask yourself, so did math start probably a cons and even natural science or mathematical science? Why, why should I be interested in what these people are talking about data journalism? Of course, you know, um, I remember 2020 during the COVID period when I completed University of Ghana, it hasn't been long actually, you know. Um, I didn't know I was actually going to find myself in this field. I knew there was something like that, but I didn't know it had so much, you know, opportunities. So <laughs> my mind wasn't even there until I saw a communique on. Uh, I think on an economic econs platform, WhatsApp platform that said that, you know, um, a media house, a reputable media house in Ghana was looking for people who are really good with numbers, you know. 
uh, as national service personnel, and if you are okay, they will actually employ you. And so I decided to take that opportunity and then God being so good, you know, I got, I got it. I got the national service opportunity. I work at Joy News, Joy FM, you know, multimedia in general. So we have in multimedia, we have the Joy brands where we have Joy FM being the senior. We also have Joy News. We have My Joy Online. We have Hits FM and then Love FM in Kumase. And then if you go to the Adom brand, which is also part of multimedia, we have Adom, Adom FM, probably you also know of Adom TV, you know of Asempa FM, and then you also know of Inshira FM uh, in Kumase. And so basically this is the group that I work with, but usually I'm stationed with Joy News, but I help the entire team with data across board, whether you are, I get requests from Adom, or I get requests from Joy or Lab FM or Insura FM or my Joy Online. I'm supposed to work, you know, for the team. And so, yeah, so I got to know of data journalism when I entered. In fact, when I entered, I thought, you know, all I was going to do was to just fetch figures for the guys, but that was what I was, I was good at doing. You know, if you had a start department, every examination period you end up working with so much data they give you an exam question and then you have probably those who are doing if you're in level 400 and you are doing an elective such as non-parametric or let's say estimation you see that most of the exam questions they give us is data packed sometimes especially uh, design of experiments where you have a lot of data you are supposed to read through and then suggest a certain design to actually deal with a certain problem. And so that was what I was good at. And Kindy for me, I had a little bit of training from ISE, um, where we did a little bit of surveys and other things. So that was my training then when I went to Joy, but I realized the horizon was bigger. There was something they called data journalism. And anyone else can be a data journalist. But if you do, if you are someone who has math training, econs training, or statistics, or mathematical science, or anything that's math inclined, or um, economics or stat inclined, you are at an advantage point. Why do I say so? Because we deal with figures more often than probably other people. But it doesn't simply mean that you have to do math, statistics, or economics to be a data journalist. Anyone can be a data journalist, no matter the kind of discipline you find yourself in. But just like I said, if you are having these characteristics or belonging to these departments, you have an advantage. And so I have, I have seen, probably let me say, seen the opportunity, and I want to sell it to, you know, folks out there because if you do start for math or actuarial science, it's not just about dreaming in the bank, insurance company, Ghana statistical service, or probably land a certain job in some um, firm where you'll be crunching it all along. There is an opportunity for us all in the media space. And it's so cool. It's, it's so lovely that, you know, when you get there and you understand what you do, it becomes, it becomes part and parcel of your life. And, when you go to work, you love to do it because that's what you are trained to do. And the opportunity is, is, is you know, um, everywhere dense in the sense that it is infinite. You keep growing and you keep finding opportunities. So I won't speak much. Um, let's just go straight to the point and ask ourselves the biggest question probably of the day. That is, what is data journalism? What is data journalism? And let me point it out that there are, there are different kinds of journalism. So probably when you hear of journalism, all that comes to mind is someone who is at a, some, someone who's at a press conference with a microphone and they've called him in the studio and is reporting about something. That's journalism actually, but that's not the entirety of journalism. Or probably someone who is on TV and is reading from a certain prompter or from a certain sheet and he's speaking big brothel, then then we term those people as journalists. No, it goes beyond that. Journalism these days 
in actual sense is growing because that is the only field that you have to know about everything. If you're, if you're a journalist, you need to know about medicine because when there are medical issues, you have to report. If you're a journalist, journalist you have to know about banking because if there are banking issues, you have to report. If you're a journalist, you need to know about economics because they will definitely read the budget and then you have to break it down for people to understand. And if you're a journalist, you have to know about energy because there will be some energy issues and then you go and cover a story and you have to come back to explain to people. But there's that one lovely part of journalism that I find is so attractive because I feel it encompasses all the aspects of journalism where that aspect of journalism is really instituted in a certain newsroom. It helps broaden the thinking and then the coverage of, you know, um, um, a media house in terms of their output and then what they put out there and then also explaining to people um, what the issue they are really talking about. So I find data journalism so, so important. And just like I said, there are different aspects of journalism and data journalism is just an aspect. And why is it so important to us? It is important to us because it is the new order. It's like the new gold. Okay, because now journalism is, is, is breathing in AI, artificial intelligence. Journalism is breathing in um, machine learning. It's breathing in data analytics. It's breathing in data analysis itself. It's breathing in high level, what we call big data or data visualization. That's the point we are at the moment where the world of journalism is actually consuming. And so I'm taking this from the perspective of um, um, BBC, where they define, you know, data journalism as uh, you say. They say the term data uh, data journalism can cover a range of disciplines, and is used in in varying ways in news organizations. So it may be helpful to define what we what we mean by data journalism at at the BBC broadly. The term covers project that use data to do or more of the following. One is to enable a reader to discover information that is personally relevant, two, reveal a story that is remarkable and previously unknown, and three, help the reader to better understand a complex issue. So simple, data journalism simply means bringing complex data down to, you know, the level of your reader. How do we bring, uh, break, how do you call it, complex data? A lot of things go into it. First, you the data journalism, data journalist yourself, you have to understand the issue, know how to break it down, and know how you are going to put your information across for your reader to actually understand. And as we proceed, I'll show you examples of stories where, data stories where, when you read it, it's so easy for you to understand, or when you watch it on TV, it's so easy for you to, you know, follow. And so a data journalist or a data general is simply someone who tells stories behind complex data by the use of effective data storytelling techniques. What are some of these techniques? Let's look at them. So when you're putting out a data story, and I know we know what is data, okay? So anything can be data. So let me share probably for us to have an idea of, I don't know if you can see the Excel sheet that's on my screen now. Hello. No, please. Can you see the Excel sheet? No, no please. please. Okay, then let me find a way to. Emmett, please. Uh, Okay, you, let me proceed. So we all know data is like, you know, some numbers. Usually when we open up, when we open up um, um, Excel sheets, we see a lot of numbers and we term those things as data. But what goes 
into putting out a data story. In it's of what actually a data story? A data story simply means that telling stories by using numbers and not just numbers, by putting the numbers in a certain way that your readers can actually, you know, understand what you're saying. So let me find a way to do this again. Let me start sharing my screen again. Uh, okay. I don't know if you can see the, the Excel sheet now. Yes, we yeah. can now see it. Okay. <laughs> so this Excel sheet is a perfect example of what we call data. So let's assume you are a it's journalist and you've been it's given. Not showing, please. It's not please showing. Yes, please. Yeah, it's, it's not showing. A list of files. It's just what? A list of files. But you can't see anything like economic aggregate, population estimate, and exchange rates. No, 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 no. We no, can, we can only see annual 2006 to 2021, annual 2013 to 2021 GDP. Okay, let me check. Uh, What about this way? Yes, please. We can answer. I'm not sure. All right. Yeah, we can answer. We can answer. Great. So this is actually Ghana's um, GDP figures, and it's rise from 2013 to 2021. And we have a lot of things estimated here. We have Ghana's population estimated right from 2013 to 20, uh, 2021. We have exchange rates. We have all these things. So basically, if I give you this information, I give this information out to any layman to read. I'm sure they will find it very difficult to understand, right? Even for those who have even done statistics, sometimes it's even difficult trying to comprehend a certain uh, data or Excel sheet. This will be difficult. Do you all agree with me? Yes, please. All right. So it is at this point that data journalism actually comes to play, where we have to employ what we call techniques in data, effective data storytelling, to put out these numbers in a way that your viewers, your listeners, your readers, Will easily understand what you are trying to say. So I ask myself, my grandmother in the village, if I share, you know, just these population figures with my grandmother in the village, she will actually find it difficult to see the difference between, let's say, 2016 population, which is 28 million, to, let's say, somewhere in 2020. My grandma in the village will find it difficult. But if I put this in graphs, Okay, if I put this in graphs, my grandma in the village can easily see that in 2016, the population was a little bit smaller than that of 2020. She can also easily see that comparing 2016's population to that of 2020, we've come a long way because of the difference in the bars. So this is the point where data journalism is really, really important because at this point, you will need people who really understand figures. You will need people who understand the statistics language or math language or economics language or people who have training. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a start or math or economics person. Just simply means someone who understands them. So you cannot study them, but you can still understand it. So you need someone who actually has an idea of these things and then actually tell the stories behind these figures. So data journalism simply means you have seen the data in its raw state. You are telling the stories behind the figures, beyond the figures. And that's what we call data journalism. I hope you all get it now. Do you all get what I just said? 
Yes, please. Yes, yes please. please. Okay. Oh, there are some Basa fans who are still following Twitter to see if they've signed Kunde. Are there any Basa fans here? <laughs> so please, we are all Madrid fans. Ah, okay. Well, let's continue. So now let's get back to, can you see my screen? I've shared a different screen, putting out a data story. Is it visible? Yes, please. It's visible, right? All right, great. So I see... How many people do we have here? We have 35 people at the moment. That's, that's impressive. And okay, so sure. So, first of all, how do you start? You have to first uh, get a story idea. How do you get a story idea? The story idea sounds microphone is on. All right, great. So first of all, you have to get a story idea. How do you get that story idea? Simple. The story idea is contained in the, in the um, how do you call it, the raw materials. Or the story idea in a, in a newsroom is what we call the raw materials. When you're building a nice house, you need raw materials, right? You need cement, you need iron rods, you need all those things to make up a very nice structure. The same thing with data journalism. When you're putting out an effective data story, you first of all have to conceive the story idea and the story idea is usually from the raw materials and i just showed you one raw material where i shared with you um, an excel sheet so that excel sheet can be a raw material where can where else can we get raw material maybe president akufuado spoke at some conference he said something that can be a raw material or let's say a top government appointee spoke somewhere and it says something important about data or concerning figures, that can be your raw material. Or let's say an NGO, a CSO, civil society organization, anybody put out a very good research work like Imani does, like um, CDD, Center for Democratic, um, whatever they do, they put it out there for you to follow. And those can be the places where you can find your story ideas. Okay, so when you're picking the story idea, first of all, you need to pick the compelling angles. When we say compelling angles, what do we simply mean? The story you may hear, let's say we are talking about inflation. We say inflation has now hit um, um, 20, I think it's 29.8% currently. Inflation is 29.8%. Yes, please. And then the government decision came to say that, oh, Ghana's inflation for June ending 2022 is now 29.8%. And you're a data journalist and you want to write a story. You just put it out there, your headline, can it just be that Ghana's inflation now hit 29.8% and then you just go and read the story? That will not be a compelling angle. So as a data journalist, you heard the government has just said that you know um, inflation has now hit twenty nine point eight percent. Wow, that's a very good and shocking re revelation. But me, as a data journalist, I won't run after and choose a headline and say inflation now twenty nine point eight percent. Blah 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 blah. They write a story. I'm a no. I'm not going to choose that. First of all, I will ask myself. What can be a very compelling angle that I can actually pick this from? So I asked myself, 29.8%. Has it ever been at this point before? If I compare this to two years, three years, four years, five years, six years, seven years, eight years ago, is it the same? So quickly, then I jump from the story idea. So you see, I'm building the compelling angle. I'm beginning to ask myself questions, important questions pertaining to the 29.8% inflation figure. Then I'll quickly think of some credible data or reliable data sources. I'll share a few with you. But first of all, when you hear of inflation, the first place, where, where, where will be the first place that you, you can go and fetch data? When you hear of inflation, can anyone help us with that?
you can unmute and then share something with us. If if you hear inflation, I'm, I'm, where, where I'm sure you can find some data from Bank of Ghana's official website. Great. Bank of Ghana is number one. Please, Ghana. please, the, the Ghana Statistical Service. Ghana Statistical Service, primary source. Primary source for inflation. Great. Uh-huh. Last one. There we go. Okay, so we're going to talk about World Bank. World Bank is the biggest data repository you can ever find in terms of longitudinal data or trend analysis or anything. So at this point, I, I know of how the Ghana Statistical Service, their system work. So I know that if I go to the Ghana Statistical Service website, I cannot easily get a trend of um, how do you call it, inflation over the years. I can get the figures all right, but it means I would have to sit down, glean the data, clean it, and then now visualize it before I see the trend. So no, Ghana Saskatchewan Service, they have given me the data, but if I'm looking for a long-term trend, I won't go to Ghana Saskatchewan Service. First, I'll quickly go to one place that you can find almost every data, and I'll share my screen with you shortly. Um, Stop sharing. And a minute, please. Let me share this. Okay. Just know what I want. Okay. Okay. Can you see my new screen? Please, it's now sharing. Yes, please, we can see. see now. What do you see now? You see World Bank, okay, what? Uh, okay. Yeah, we can see. What do you see? World Bank Open Data. Well, yeah, what open data. Yes, please. As a, as a data journalist, this is one two pack, or this is one data source that you always have to be. Is, it, is someone asking a question? Okay, let's continue. So, World Bank open data, you can put it down. This is a very good data repository. Okay. So I know that World Bank can give me an interactive data for long term period for, you know, a, a, a long trend. So what do you see? You see two things um, under the browser. You can see country, right? And you can see indicator. So indicator simply means what you are looking for and country means which country are you actually talking about? So I'll quickly go to indicator. And you can see data on agric and rural development. Inflation is not under agric, so I'll quickly scroll. But here you can see a quick, um, um, let's say link that they've shared here. You see economy and what? Growth, right? Can you all see economy and growth? Yes. Yes, please. Yes, Great. please. So I'll, I'll click on economy and growth. And it takes me to a list. And then I have to choose what I want. What I want is inflation. And we know inflation is CPI, right? Consumer price index. So I see inflation, GDP deflator. That's not what I want. I want inflation itself. So let's see where, where is inflation. Okay, I see inflation here. Have you all seen it? Inflation, consumer price, yeah, annual yeah. rate. So I click on yeah. that one. And when you click on it, you see it has given you a very good trend analysis of data. And what you see here is world data. I, I, I'm not looking for world, okay? This is giving you world inflation over the years from 1981 to 2021, okay? So I'm looking for Ghana. I'm not looking for the entire world. So I'll come here and type Ghana, then hit enter. 
then quickly you see World Bank changing the search from wealth now to where to Ghana. Great. Then now have in mind that the, the government statistician has reported that inflation is now 29.8%. So I'll be going through, when was the last time we recorded inflation 29.8%? It can't be 2016 because that's 17%. So I look for a different peak. 2019, no, that's 19. 20, 2003, great, bingo. 2003 was the last time we recorded an inflation and it's exactly the same thing. Do you realize? Do you all see? Yes, please. That's exactly the same 29.8%. Yes, please. So, so uh, 2008 to 2022, how many years? Yeah, no. 19 years? years. 19. 19 years. Great. So now I know the difference in time. 19 years was the last time we had an inflation as high as 29.8%. Great. I have my headline now. So all right. Inflation hit 19 year high, you know, record 19 year high. Or inflation hit a 19 year high record. Or inflation skyrocketed to 19 year high rate. Do you understand? So anyone who picks my story. Right from the onset, the person doesn't even have to go through the story and listen or read or watch. The person knows that, hey, say Ghana inflation, I can't want to me. The last time I yin 29.8% was 19 years ago. So the person is now like, hey, 19 years ago, that's a long time. It means we we are we've improved over the years, but at the moment we've gone back to the worst situation we were how many years ago? 19 years ago. Great. So you see with this type of um, search that I did, it has helped me to avoid just writing inflation hits 29.8%. And so what? You need to do a comparative analysis. You need to compare it to something so that when the reader is reading your story, is watching your story, or is listening to you on radio, they know that you know inflation has now hit a 19-year high um, you know, rate. And then they can easily judge from there. And so that's a very good example that we can actually, so you can check over the periods we've had, inflation being as high as 122.9%. That was right after the 80, 83 come, right? So those figures, I'm not interested in that. I was looking for the last time inflation was that high. Now I found it, I'll leave all the other figures behind. And so one place you can find data, I'll share a lot with you, but one place you can find data is the uh, World Bank data repository. World Bank data repository. Any data you want, you can find it there. Any data you want on any country, you can find it over there uh, on the World Bank website. So now that um, you know, um, I know my data sources, what I have to do is to now, I'm now going to write a story, okay? So my readers, my reader at home wants me to put the story in a way that when they easily see it, they know that inflation has risen. So that's what we call extraction and cleaning of the data. So usually when the Ghana Saskia service, they release the inflation figures, it is in Excel. I can pick inflation rise from the beginning of the year, which is January to, June that we are talking about and do a, a very simple infographic that will tell us how inflation has risen from January to, um, let's say, June, okay? Then the story doesn't end there. Inflation has risen to a 19-year high, high rate. So what? What is the compar comparison with how, how, how different are other African countries doing, okay? So I'll quickly have to ask myself, hey, so what is inflation in Nigeria right now? What's inflation in Ivory Coast right now? What's inflation in, um, let's say, Kenya right now? What's inflation in South Africa right now? Then quickly, I have to find another data source and put that comparative analysis also there so that I'm building a story. Now I have moved away from the trend now to comparing Ghana to other African countries. So one place that you can find inflation a figures when you want to do a comparative analysis to other countries is what we there's a website called 
um, trading economics. Trading economics. So let me see if I can find it. Trading economics. Uh, I'm stop sharing my screen and go to trading economics. Okay, so trading, trading economics. Inflation in Africa. Okay. Bingo. So now I'm there. Let me share my screen for you to see what I'm talking about. So, is that trading economics? Where are you? Right. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, please. So, yes, please. All right. Trading economics, that's where you can find comparative analysis of countries and then their inflation. It will rank it for you. Great. So, this is inflation for all African countries. So, we have the country in this column. We have the last time inflation was actually updated here in the previous one. So, you can actually do a comparative analysis when it was changed and then the current um, rates. So if you go somewhere like South Sudan, inflation is, they actually have a deflation, but South Sudan is not really a place you want to compare to Ghana because they have a lot of indicators that you can't really compare to Ghana. But I know of Ivory Coast, I can compare Ivory Coast to Ghana because relatively they have almost like the same GDP or you know around the same population, also in the same sub-region. Okay, so bingo, I see Ivory Coast here. So Ivory Coast inflation is 5.4%. The last time they updated was um, June 2020, and that's 5.4. But that of um, in May, right, was 3.5. 3 it means that Ivory Coast inflation has now risen from 3.5 to what? 5.4. I know Ivory Coast is now lower than Ghana. So now let me check other country like South Africa. South Africa is now 7.4. It was initially 6.5. Great. South Africa is also lower than Ghana. So you see, as I scroll down, the inflation rate begins to increase. So it means I'm, I've still not seen Ghana. So it means Ghana is down there. So Kenya. Kenya is now 7.9. Previously was 7.1. I also see Senegal 8.9. And last time the updated was 7.4. Zambia 9%. I still can't find Ghana. Let me scroll down. Rwanda. I know Rwanda is 16.1. Still can't find Ghana. Nigeria, almighty Nigeria is 18.6. So I know Nigeria's inflation is lower than that of Ghana now. Bingo, I see Ghana, 29.8%. <laughs> and you can actually see that Ghana is last but four, right? And all the countries that we have beat, most of them are abnormal in terms of their rates. Look at Sudan, 149 means they have a peculiar challenge. Zimbabwe, they also have a peculiar challenge of uh, 192 inflation rate. I know they have. So if you take those abnormal people out, it means Ghana is actually when we are ranking inflation figures, we have almost like second, the worst inflation figure in Africa. Are you following now? Yes, please. Great. So I can put this part in my in my in my presentation or in my story. Great. So I know now I've seen the trend from two, 2003, and I know inflation is now you know, the same as 19 years ago. And I now also know that Ghana's inflation is higher than most of African countries. Great, I'm putting this in my stories. So let me go to my draw line and see if I did that story. And then let's see how I did that story. So folks, so let me use this opportunity to advertise and let you know that if you want to find comprehensive news source, news articles you want to read, don't go anywhere. But always search for my joy online is your most, you know, credible news source you can find in Ghana. We have everything for you over there, politics, sports, you know, data, anything, name it, entertainment. It's on my joy online.
Okay. So bingo, enough of the adverts. Let me go to my journal line and see if I did that story. All right. So, Christian. Christian Ali sent it to me. How many please? I'm not sure we can finish this by 8.30. So we'll do the first tranche or the first part, and then tomorrow you can join again for the second bit. But I'll give you an opportunity to answer questions. Please, are you sharing a screen because I can't see yeah. one? Yeah, I'm sharing a screen, so I'll let you when I do so. Thank you. You're welcome, dear. Please, can you see my screen now? Yes, it's loading. It's loading, yeah. When yeah, it comes to see the best, the best news um, website in Ghana. Have you seen it? Yes, You've seen my join line, right? Yes, <laughs> Great. So I actually did that story. And let's see how I did the story. So when you are writing a story, <laughs> When you're writing a story, first thing, after conceiving, uh, conceiving the story idea, you need to think about your headline. So what is a headline? The headline is more or less like the summary before the summary. Okay. So the summary before the summary is like the headline. So that will give you the first summary. Then, then there's another one we call the lead. The lead will give you the second summary. So more or less like the executive summary. Okay. So what you see, current 29.8% inflation rate mimics 2003 HIPAA figure. When you hear of this, or when you read this headline, it's interesting. It means that you can actually infer that A. So it means that the inflation we have right now was the same inflation we had when we were HIPAA in 2003, right? Yes, yes. Great. So it means, apart from comparing to other countries, I also went ahead to check 2003. So what actually happened in Ghana? Ghana went to HIPIC actually in 2002. But in 2003, we were still under the HIPIC program. So it was fair to still state that 2003 was a HIPIC year. HIPIC years yeah. were 2002, 2003, 2004, and late 2005. And probably we exited somewhere late 2005. That's the HIPIC period. All right, so let's see how I did a story. So my headline has been captured and then I'm giving you my executive summary. It says current inflation rate 29.8%. And I give the year, it's a year on year inflation rate. So it's June 2022 year on year inflation. It's exactly the same rate recorded in 2003 when the country was under the highly indebted poor country program, HIPIC which started in 2002. If you've not read the entire story, but this executive summary has given you a picture of what I'm talking about, isn't it? Yes. Great. So now, what do I do? I want you to visually understand what I am doing or the story I'm talking about. So I embedded a screenshot of the World Bank website. Do you remember that website? Yes, yes. We just saw that. Yes, so I took a screenshot. Great. I took a screenshot of it indicating that actually I know my source. My source is World Bank. The World Bank says that in 2003, our inflation was 29.8%. It's exactly the same inflation I recorded in June. Do you now see it? So anyone reading this can use this. Um, well, I, could have, I could have visualized this but I think I was constrained. I was hard pressed for time, so I couldn't really do a very good visualization. So I just decided to take a screenshot. Other than that, I'll show you other ones where we did very good visualization. Okay. So now I continue. In 2022, Ghana received debt relief amounting to, so here I'm just talking about what we call HIPIC and then what it meant and all those, you can read for yourself. I don't want to bore you with any reading, but, just to say that, uh -huh. now you see 
right after that, I'm giving you another, what we call infographic, well-designed data, you know, on a certain um, um, card. This is what we call infographic, okay? So usually you see, we, you see Joy News flying some of these um, graphics. So you can see them in people's website pages, statuses on social media. You see, you usually see some of these things. We fly most of these things around for you to, yeah. so, that, so that you don't have to go and read plenty things, but just by coming across this, you know, currently we are now doing an inflation of 29.8%. So I embedded this one in it so that the, the reader will also understand. So I'll share this story with you here so that those who want to practice can use this as a yardstick. I'll send a story idea as well. So those of us who are interested can write a story on it. I'll share different data. You can write a story. I'll share everything with the peer. She'll share with you. And then when you're done, you can send me, um, um, how do you call it? <laughs> a sample of what you did via mail using my, my mail that I shared. When, I'm, when, I, when we are done, I'll, I'll, I'll go over my mail again. So you can share with me, we'll go through. And then if you need any other coaching too, I'll let you know. But mind you, Data journalism is not just about writing online story. This is one means of output. You can also be on radio too, okay? It means this thing that I have here, they can ask me to come and talk about it on radio. So let's see how I script my, my, radio, my radio script. Let me see if I still have it. Uh, oh, it's two minutes to time. Do I have the radio scripts in question? Please hold on. Oh, I don't remember how I saved it, but I know it will be somewhere. Okay, let's just continue. Um, okay, so this one way of presenting your story as a data journalist, this is online. You can have on TV. So let me share with you how we do this on TV as well. So, uh, okay. So we've all been hearing about um, address for not going to parliament, right? Yes. Yes. First about ahead. the absentee uh -huh. parliament. Great. Very good. We've also heard there are three, right? Address are for who and who? Address are for, and um, is it? I don't know if Kennedy is Japan. Japan. I don't know, but there are two other meals. Kennedy is Japan, and then Henry Cote, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. So I'm going to share how we did the story on TV. So that you know how we also do data journalism on TV. Um, let me. Okay. Yes, I know. Will this meeting end exactly eight thirty? Not at all. It's not time. Come again, please. It's not time. It it's not time, so I can continue. Yes, please. Will we continue. all subs? Will we all subscribe to me stretching this meeting to nine o'clock so we can have a very good first training then we'll continue tomorrow? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Sure. I think the yes have it. So let's continue. I'm not heading in no one. Okay, I'm going to share a different screen and that will be. Okay, so um, a minute, please. Oh, I'm sure I've shared a different screen. It's a YouTube something. I don't know if you've seen it. It's loading. Okay. It's in.
Okay. So on this story, this is how we did a story. So I actually did all the search. One place that you can find a lot of data is on Parliament's website. I'll take you through shortly. Where you can find, you can actually, when the parliamentarians go to Parliament, they actually mark register. So you can find that online. I'll show you how to retrieve that data. So this, this work you see, what I'm coming to share with you, we use about uh, four days to glean all the data, to clean it, and to visualize it for our viewers, listeners, and then uh, readers to actually have a good feel of it. We actually have to do a lot of hard work on this data because imagine 275 members and they are checking absentees, absenteeism within a certain period is almost like a year. They are checking one by one, every minister. That was difficult. And then checking for three ministers was, in, uh, was also a Herculean tax. So this is what we did. So you can actually have a look. Can you hear the sound? Is the audio working? No, please. I've not started a video yet. Maybe that's why. Okay, so here I joined a colleague, Blazer Soga, in the studio to talk about it and see how we covered the story for, for our viewers to understand. The sound is not working. I don't know if it's my network. Yeah, the sound, I think Zoom has this challenge of overly, but I just want you to look at the sound is not really, it would have been appropriate to listen to the sound, but without that, we can still just look at, I just want you to look at how we did the graphics. Okay. Yes, please. And then you how we presented it. There's a, there's a sound in the background. Can you all hear me now? Yes. Okay. So this is what I want to put across. That with by this uh, graphics that we did or, or data visualization, if you look at the period October to December 2021, you know Parliament has three meetings, right? So we have January to, I think, March, and then the, the break and then something. I think four or five, four or three meetings they have in Parliament. So, so we are talking about October to December meeting. We're trying to check if can report how many times was he absent? How many times was he absent without permission? And how many, what was his longest consecutive absence without permission? What do we mean by longest consecutive absence without permission? So we know per our laws, if a minister absents himself without permission for 15 consecutive, consecutive means without break, consecutive sittings for 15 times, that MP loses his seat, right? So we're checking. October to December 2021 meeting. If you can see, Kennedy Japan, there were 28 sittings. It means parliament, they did order, order 28 times. So 28 sittings and Kennedy Japan out of the 28, he was present in just four, okay? So you see the green button meaning present and then the rest means he was absent, okay? Whether absent without permission or without with permission, we don't know. The next one talks about absent with permission. Absent, sorry, absent without permission. So you can see that out of the 28 um, sittings, he was absent without permission 24 times. It means the last four meetings where he, he was present, that was the, that, the last four meetings he was present, but the last 24 meetings he was absent. And in all cases, he did not ask for permission. Are you following? Yes. Then we try to answer the biggest question of the day. What has been his consecutive absence in this period that we are talking about? So we checked. 
out of the 28 sittings, he was absent 19 consecutive times. And that's what's the threshold. The threshold is 15, right? But he was absent in 19. Okay. So it means he has breached the law. Great. Let's move on to another person. Um, Hello. Sarah Adwasapo. So this period, Sarah Adwasapo was present two out of 28 sittings. She was absent with permission, with permission. So it means there was a time that Adwasapo was absent and she had permission to be absent. That was seven out of 28. Absent without permission was 19 out of 28. And then her longest consecutive absence was 13. It means in this period, Ajua Safo did not break the law. Are you getting me? So, yes. so Kennedy Japan broke the law, 15 sentence. He did 19. So definitely he broke the law. Ajua, 15. She did 13. She needed two more to break it. She didn't what? She didn't break the law in this period. Let's check Henry Corte. We spoke more on Adjoasafo. Okay. So Henry Corte, within that same period, he was present five out of 28 sittings, absent for 23 out of 28 sittings. His longest consecutive absence was also 19. It means Henry Corte also breached the law. So in this period I'm talking about, December, December, I'm sorry, October to December, the only person, person who broke the law were Henry Corte and who? Adjoasafo. Uh, sorry, Henry Corte and Kennedy Japan, but Adjoasafo did not work. She did not break the law, right? Are we all following? Yes, please. So we ask ourselves, ah, so if Ajah Safo hasn't broken the law, why is it that the majority and the other parliamentarians are making a big fuss out, out of the whole thing? So you can't really judge, but because this is just one period. So we move to a different period and see if Ajua will break the law. Great. So we move from 2021 now to 2022, March. Right here, we see Kennedy Japan doing well. In 2022, when they were actually needed in parliament to come and help pass the e levy, Kennedy Japan was present 12 out of 28 sittings, absence 16 out of 28 sittings, and his longest consecutive absence without permission was just four. He did not break the law in this period that they crucially needed the MPs. He was present. Then we moved to Ajwa. Great. So what do you see here? So you can actually see that in one breath, Ajwa was, was safe. In the other, she wasn't safe at all. Because from January to March, when the finance minister had read the budget in, in November and needed them to pass the e-levy by February ending so that they can start getting raking in revenue by March. Ajwa was nowhere to be found. There were 28 sittings in this period. She didn't attend any of them. And in all 28 sittings where she was absent, she did not ask for permission. So you see why they were furious. I hope you are following. Yes, please. Yeah. So this is the work of a data yes, journalist. <laughs> Someone mentioned my my Nikki. That was when I was. <laughs> Ruben, please. Oh, Ruben, welcome. Thank you. All right. So, so this is the work of a data journalist. Okay. They can actually see that in one breath, Adwa was safe. In the other, she wasn't. So, as a data journalist, you need to make sure that your checks. Do not fail anybody. If you are doing the checks within a certain period, make sure you do it within a certain period for everybody and analyze it to see who is at fault. So you see, if it were to be someone, he or she have just analyzed the first period, October to March. He saw I just have was present. Just that he said, oh, this boy, they were telling us, they just want to crucify the woman. But if you extend the analysis to January to March, you see that, hey, she, she's actually culpable in this period that we are talking about. Do you get what I'm trying to say? So as a data journalist, you need, I'll show you where we pick this data from and you appreciate the work of data journalism because without my grandmother in the village cannot go to parliament's website and pick and see, hey, 
a Japon or by an hour, but a job by an hour. She can't do that for almost one year. It is the work of a data journalist, data journalist in a team to actually sit down, get all this data, and work on it. So let me sh let me show you. Um, okay, let me finish. To be fair, let's finish with Henry Corte too, so that I don't do a bias analysis. Uh, Henry Corte, Mr. Giant. Okay, Henry Corte in this period, well, he was safe because he was present three out of twenty sittings, twenty five meetings. He was absent. But his longest consecutive absence was just 12. He needed 12 to be culpable. He needed 15 actually to be to, to reach the law, but he just did 12. So but it was safe in this period. Great. So the first period that we talked about, Henry Corte and um, Kennedy Japan were culpable. Ajua Safo was safe. But in this period, Ajua Safo is not safe. Henry Corte and Kennedy Japan are safe. I, I hope you are following the argument. Yes, please. And then it becomes more dire for Adjoa Safu because a whole 28 sittings, she was not present in any of them. And it was not as if she was she was absent with permission. In all 28 absent, absent, absent that we take for her, she was absent without permission. Let me roll over to the data source. So let me stop sharing the screen and Sit, share the all right, so let's move all the way to Parliament. Please, question. I'm coming, please. You can ask your question. Please, why, why is it that still there? Like, they have their seats. Why are they not using regulations or laws? Oh, so why haven't they lost their seats? Yeah. Okay, so I don't know if you are aware that they say parliaments, they are the master of their own laws, right? Yes. So these three MPs were referred to what we call the Privileges Committee. And then, although Ajoa Safo did not appear, Henry Corte and then Kennedy Japan appeared before the Privileges Committee. And the committee agreed that, you know, they are at fault, but we should forgive them. Mm -hmm. For Ajoa Safo, they actually they said they put out Zoom link for her to join because she's in the US. She didn't join. They publish everything in the daily. She didn't appear. So they've, they've actually pushed the, her matter to the plenary, which is the parliament in general to decide on it. But Kennedy Japan and Henry Court have been forgiven by the, the Privileges Committee. I hope I've answered your question. Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm sharing a different screen. Let me. How many are we doing now? Uh, okay, so sharing. All right, so I'm taking you to Parliament's website. Okay, can you see my screen? Hello. Yes. Yes. Please. Can you see my screen? Yes please. yes, please. All right, so I'm logging yeah. into Parliament's website. Great. So this, mind you, as a data journalist, this one place you should be visiting almost every day because Parliament's website has a lot of data. So when you log on to the website, you see there are how many? One, two, three, four, five, six threads here. I'm interested in uh, which one? Where do I go? Where do I... Great. I'm interested in parli parliamentary business because under parliamentary business, I want to find out which MP was absent within a certain period. And that can only be contained in what they call votes and proceedings in parliament. Votes and proceedings. So I check home. There's nothing there. Our parliament, there's nothing there. But under parliamentary business, I see votes and proceedings, right? So I click on votes and proceedings. And just look at this. How many way do you see here? A lot, right? So you can see rise from, so the latest one they put out there was um, Friday, 1st April, 2022. So you see all the others down there. And it, these numbers tells you that there's more, right? 
Yes, please. So this is the work we do. We did. We have to download all of this. Let me download. If I download one for you to see, you can see the kind of way that goes through. So it means that as a data journalist, your work is really important in the newsroom or in when it comes to production. And you need to learn how to work fast, efficient, and become more reliable because everybody will rely on you for data. Everybody will rely on you for information. Everybody will rely on you for valid and credible information. And you can only do that when you know where to find the information. And when you yourself, you build what we call a rep repository or data, a data bank. So myself, I have a data bank on my machine that I refer to you know, whenever someone needs a data or something. Yeah. So that's what I was sharing. I wanted to share with you. So I just wanted to know that we had to put in a lot of work to actually put this thing out there that is so simple like that. A lot of work had to go into it. Okay. Let's get back to the lecture notes and uh, presentation, actually. All right, so I won't bore you much analysis, visualizing, talking about that. Then I told you, when you're done with your story, the story can go on either TV, radio, or where? Online. So maybe you want to see how, we, you, you've seen how we do it on TV, right? I've shown you how we do it online. I've showed you how we do it on TV, but I've not showed you how we do it on radio. So let me try and see if I can show you how it is done on radio. Okay, so can you see my screen? Um, yes, please. Show us. So you see, my WhatsApp itself is is a search engine because everything is in code so it, to help me work faster, and you know, so I've saved most of the works I've done here. Try and see if I can fetch something for you. Um, Try and see if I can find top story. Okay. <sighs> All right. So on radio, there is a presenter. And she's MFA Pau. And then you, as the data journalist, you come in to do. So, here we're talking about Ghana going to the IMF. So, you see, I had to go, go and gather, gather data to come and talk about how many times we've been to the IMF. So, this is a radio studio. So, it means everything you are coming to talk about, you can either script it or come and do what we call X. Tempo. X tempo means everything must be from your head. But when you're dealing with data, it's good to script, at least put down certain things so that when you come to the studio, you can actually flow and be quick and know what you're talking about. Because sometimes X tempo, you can end up talking about irrelevant things. So here, MFO was simply asking me about um, the different IMF programs Ghana can have, how many times you've gone to the IMF, what's in for Ghana and all those things. So that's how we do it on radio. So you could actually see I was reading from my phone. So it means I've scripted everything. Everything was on my phone. So once in a while, I refer to my phone so that I don't get lost in terms of what I'm talking about and everything. So that's how it's done on radio. It means just like I was talking to you about outputs. Your outputs can be on TV, can either be on online, very important, or be on radio. Yeah, so I was talking about output. And I've shared with you how 
how we actually how we actually do this on join news i've shown you i've showed you how we present our data stories online how we present our data stories on tv and i represent our data stories on radio but there's one part that i have to share with you which is infographics okay so there's radio there's tv there's online but in on online, we have a subset, which is called social media, right? Social media is a subset of the whole online thing. So we also go ahead to create infographics so that our viewers, we can actually fly these things around for our viewers to quickly look at them and then appreciate them. So some, sometimes you see some of these things, and you see people putting some of these things on their statuses. This, as a data journalist, your work is to do some of these things, help the team to compile this, visualize them in a way. So you see this one, for instance, Euro bond market. Euro bond market is simply a place where we go to borrow, okay, as a country. So we are we are doing a comparative analysis, Mahama and Akufuado, who has borrowed more from the Euro bond market? And just look at it. It's clear Akufuado has borrowed more than Mahama. I'm not trying to do politics in here. I'm just trying to say what the data is saying, okay? So Mahama has been, just by looking at this infographics, you can see Mahama has been to the Euro market four times. First one was in 20, 2013, right? And he borrowed, uh, he borrowed 1 billion, 2014, 1 billion, 2051 billion dollars, 2016, 750 million dollars, totaling 3.75 billion. Then, Akufuado and then his finance minister have also been there four times, two billion, three billion, three billion, and three billion, totaling, you know, eleven point five billion. So, I may not write anything about this, but when I put this out there, and a reader or someone who is surfing for information on, and social media sees it, you can easily see that, hey, yeah, call Europe markets now, the Israel Mama government borrowed less than Akufuado government. But that's not what we actually wanted to put out. We also wanted to communicate and say that, you know, over the years as a country, we borrowed close to almost 14 billion from the Euro market and we are still broke. So what do we do with the monies? So it wasn't just about doing Mahama and Akufuado, but it's to also put a question to the reader of the person having this information that, hey, so all these monies in, in eight years, what have we done with it? And we are going to IMF for a peanut of, let's say, two billion. So those are some of the questions wanted it to run through your heads when you are reading or you know going through some of these things. And then there's also another infographic. We have a lot of these on our social media platform. I just decided to pick two. This is it's on bribe, bribery and corruption. It was just released, I think, three days ago. Top six bribe tickets in the private sector. First. Is teachers and lecturers, hey, in private schools, the 9%. Hello. Hello. Hi. Can I hear hello or you can all hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, we can hear you. So, top says bribe tickets in the private sector, teachers and lecturers, number one, followed by doctors and nurses. Private sector guards, security guards, sorry, insurance companies, hey, then other businesses, and then bank employees. So, right, I can't, I won't write anything about this, but as a reader, when you see this, you know that private sector, yeah, more much bribe is teachers and lecturers in private schools, right? They are number yes, one. Please. And this research was done by was done by the Ghana Sascal Service, you know, in collaboration with other you know stakeholders all right so we are done with that i also want to talk about tupac so you saw you saw us doing a lot of data work okay you know how what 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 tools do we use to generate this nice infographics you see you know we can talk about a lot but me my best friend are uh, these two first is powerpoint most of us think PowerPoint is just for classroom presentation, but PowerPoint has a, a lot of powerful features that we can use. Then we have another best friend of mine, Canva. Then my all-time favorite, R. 
So maybe I know those who are from the study department, they are conversant with this. Hour. But once in a while, we use um, Photoshop, Power BI, when we are doing big projects, then Microsoft um, Illustrator. Then we also use one of my favorites, um, Data Wrapper. Data Wrapper actually helps you to create, I'll share, this is very important, let me, let me share this. You can practice actually on Data Wrapper as a data journalist. Data Wrapper helps you to create beautiful interactive maps. Sometimes we put some of these maps on the TV or online, and then you see it just touching, then you see the figure will pop out, and then you can, it's nice. It gives you a very good look and feel. But how do we do it? Let me share my screen and show you how that is also done. So let me see. Uh, data Rapper, where are you? Data Rapper, where are you? Okay, so I think I have I have it now. So let me share my screen. Great, Bingo. You see my screen now? Yes, please. I just logged in. Why are you giving me this? Hold. On. Let me open from this side. So that's. Asa fans, are you there? Are we, Are you getting Kunde or Chelsea? Is? Chelsea. Is. I like that voice. Chelsea is. Yeah. All right, so I've shared a new screen. Can you see it? This is how data wrapper looks like. So I remember I did a story on the Russia Ukraine tensions. I wanted to find out how many people had left um, Russia due to the Ukraine tension. I, only, I, I, I didn't want to just find out how many people had left. I wanted to find out when they left Russia, uh, Ukraine, sorry, where did they go? Okay, so I use Data Wrapper to create this nice interactive map that I embedded in my online story. If you go to my journal online and search for Isaac Kofi J, Ukraine Russia Tension, I'm sure you see the story there. You can read and see how I captured that story. And you see, I've created this nice interactive map with Data Wrapper. So, first, I started with this. When you go into Data Wrapper, they give you just four steps. So, first one is what you call select map so you select the type of map you want i know i selected europe because i know russia and the place they flew to uh, somewhere around europe then i proceeded to select to select um to input my data so I knew the number of people who had, who had left Ukraine to Poland, so I inputted it here. I knew, I knew the number of people who had left Romania to, uh, sorry, Ukraine to Romania. I picked this data from the UNHCR. They are very, it's a very good data source. You can try that one out too. So then I just visualized it. Very simple. So after visualizing, data wrapper then gives me this beautiful map, which will show shortly. Great. So the map is showing, hey, why is it not coming? Okay. So you see, what you see, I have actually, let me go back and then. You can check my dashboard. You can see I've done a lot of projects with Data Wrapper, a lot of things. Done a lot of things with Data Wrapper, but I'm still interested in the Russia Ukraine thing. So I'll click on it again. Yeah, so I don't bore you too much with this thing. 
I just wanted you to know how interactive that map is. So I will embed this in my journal. So if you are reading the story, I click on it like this, you can, it, it will pop out, Russia. How many people are, have left Ukraine to Russia? How many people? That's uh, 271,000 people. How many people have left Ukraine to Poland? That's 200 and 214,000 people. Or oh, no, this is actually That's 2 million, million right? People. 2 million, yeah, 2 million people. Then you can see. So you see the color grading here means the deeper the blue, the higher the number. You get it, right? So I just embed this in my story and then the reader can just click on it and then I said some of this and then it's, it's nice, it's interactive. And you can actually see those things, yeah. So wrapping up, um, let me go back to you. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, I can hear you, please. Please do we do we pay for all these two packs? The the oh some of them you pay, but some are free. I'm coming. Let me let me show you the ones that are free. And the data wrapper, for instance, is free. But if you want to get more professional features, you can subscribe. So so for instance, some of the data sources I'll show you. Some you have to subscribe. Some is is free. So, but these two packs. For instance, we all know Microsoft can be pirated in Ghana. It's free. Canva is partially free, but I've, I have subscribed to Canva, and I pay I paid I think forty eight dollars a year for Canva, and it gives you and you can actually see it here. It's actually something I use most often. I use it for flyers. I use so many things. I use it to so even sometimes if I want PowerPoint, I even use Canva to do my PowerPoint. So this presentation you actually seen, I use Canva to do it. It's free, but you can actually pay the 40, 48 out, sorry, $48, with around 344 CDs per year to enjoy unlimited tools on Canva. Then SQL or SQL, anyhow you want to call it, we also ask also partially free. Um, Microsoft, sorry, um, Adobe Photoshop. Adobe Photoshop is also, we have the crash free. Data wrapper, relatively free, but if you want to get more, you can get it. R, we know it's an open source free. Power BI, open source free. Um, this one, you know, Illustrator is also relatively free. Okay. One thing that I also want to talk about is data sources. As a data journalist, what makes you on top of your game is your data sources or your data source. It must be credible. It must be on point. It must come to your aid when you are in trouble. Come to your aid when you're in trouble. What does it mean? It means that when you quote figures from this place, and someone wants to challenge you, you can just say, hey, I pick it from Bank of Ghana. You can't challenge me. I'm not Bank of Ghana. Bank of Ghana said it. So as a data journalist, you always have to re reference your data to a certain point, okay? So what, these are some, there are a lot. These are, you know, places that I mean, I play with almost, I play, these are my playgrounds almost every day when I go to work. I search for data here almost every time. One is Bank of Ghana, very good place. Bank of Ghana is actually one of the biggest data repositories you can find in Ghana. There's also Ghana Saskatchewan. We also have, Almighty IMF, we have a lot of data on Ghana. You can see the number of times Ghana has been to the IMF, how much we are owing IMF, um, every year how much we pay to IMF in terms of you know, interest payments and other things also there. Then our dear friend, World Bank, it helped us to do that um, um, inflation story, you remember, right? And then also we have um, Parliament, which helped us to do the address of full story. And one of my favorites, uh, Ministry of Finance, their website. That's where you can get all the, the, the budget statements from. And then they also published something they called uh, they call uh, program based budget. So it's a budget for all the ministries. So if you want to see our Ministry of Education is spending, you can go and download that. Check.
how much Ghana is spending on free SHS, how much we are spending on basic education, how many teachers are in Ghana, how many basic schools are in Ghana, how many tertiary schools are in Ghana. You can check that from Finance Ministry's program-based budget, PBB. And also what we call OEC data, very important. If you want to check information on tax, what's our tech, tax to GDP ratio? How much does Ghana raise from tax? You can equally check that on, on Bank of Ghana and Ministry of Finance, but OEC gives you a comparative analysis to other countries. We also have OEC. This is so important. You can find trade data. The last time I was seven, and I found out that in 2020, Ghana was the highest importer of um, foes, what we call second-hand clothes. You can find a lot of data on <laughs> OEC. And then the UNHCR, it's helped me to do that um, Ukraine-Russia war thing. If you go there right now, I can actually see the number of people who have fled from Ukraine, from Russia to else other places. How many refugees have, have flown from Russia to uh, from Ukraine to other places? To give you other interesting statistics, we're supposed to do fact checking. Another important part, but we'll leave that for tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll brush us through what we did today. And then we'll go deeper into fact checking, okay? Because it's so important that as a data journalist, without fact checking, you are more or less like, um, you know, a normal, sorry, but like a disabled, you know, human being, not to be offend, of, offending anybody, but just to know, like you have a disability. Let me put it that way so that it will not sound negative. So you ask yourself, if, I'm a data journalist. Can I really apply it in Ghana? Are there opportunities? Yes, there are. One place where there's an opportunity is where I work, multimedia group, where there's an opportunity at Joy News, there's an opportunity at Joy FM. So I know some of you, I think just one person, um, did, came to do an internship with us um, during your last vacation. He was with us for three weeks and he learned a lot, not only data journalism, but he also learned a lot on how to go on assignments. He was, he was exposed to a lot of things, met a lot of big people, you know, ministers, government officials, appointees and all places. Other stations that are also doing well when it comes to data journalism, you can go to City, City TV or City FM. And then also recently, um, TV3 and um, 3FM, they're also doing better or well when it comes to data journalism. But maybe I'll be biased. We are actually doing it better than other people. I don't sound biased, but that's what it is because we have invested a lot. We actually have a desk called Joy Research Desk that we actually do this. And we do this on an everyday basis. It's part of what we do. It's not that we do it when it comes, but it's part of what we do. It has created an opportunity for people to join us. So for instance, I know those who are completing this year, there was an opportunity that came, I think it was it was shared or distributed on the, the University of Ghana economics platform, the AWASA platform that join News Need. I don't, some, I'm, I'm sure some of you saw this communique that, Media House needed or Joy FM needed people to come and do national service. We actually did the interview last month and we've selected two or three people who will come and then join the team. And if their performance is, is what we are looking for, they'll be given permanent employment. So all I'm saying is that there's an opportunity. This is a fast growing area that as statistics student, as a trans science, science student, as a mathematics student, as economy student, as philosophy student, as anybody, you should take advantage of. It doesn't necessarily have to be because I've said it. You have to find the interest in it. Already you have, you are at an advantage point, you know the figures. So when you come in, when you come in, it's so easy for you to actually, you know, um, find your feet and then work properly in a joy news or joy fm my joy online and don't anywhere else so basically that's my presentation for today i still go by is a coffee j and it's very important to me because i joined twitter 2017 but i wasn't really active just now that i've decided to be active so you can follow me on twitter at with the handle 
being displayed here, Isaac, Kofi, and Jay. You can follow me and then see most of the works I do on my daily basis, what I tweet about and some of the things that I talk about. And I also said you can follow me or, you know, interact with me on LinkedIn using Isaac, Kofi, and Jay. And if you want to reach me personally, you can reach me via my mail, isaac.j at myjoyonline.com. At this point, I'll hand over to Equia, who has done a very good job. I think she's she's been communicating with me almost every time for us to put this together. She's really done well. She has her, her association at heart, and she's doing all she can to actually have a partnership with um, the multimedia group so that we can have students from material science and statistics coming to do their national service internship and other opportunities trying to fight for slot i think she's she's done so well and she she actually you know deserved to be commended thank you thank you very much so i think someone has been under okay hello please Please, how do you get a lecture slide? How do you what? Can you ask a question again? Please, I said, how do we get the lecture slides? Slides, you want my slide? Oh, so I'll share with the queer. It's not, it's not a big deal at all. I'll share with the queer and she will find a way to. Or you can you can you can send me a message. Um via mail or you can send me a mail i'll share with you if you feel sharing with the crowd will be a problem or it will take a long time but i know she's efficient so when i share with her she'll share with you but if you want to reach me personally for the slides you can send me a mail okay so i'll call on michael to give us a boot of things we, are we done with the questions uh, is there anyone Is there anyone who has any question for our uh, speaker? Before I ask the question, sorry. Yeah, if you said you give us some something to work on and then send to you via mail. Yes, please. Um, how yeah. So we the same thing, it will go through a query again. But just like I said, you can also send me a message or you can send me a mail and I'll share with you. So basically, I'm just going to share a data source with you. And then the work that I did on the, um, how do you call it, the inflation. So that you can use that as a guide to work on another story. So that you can share your final output with me, we discuss, if you have any questions, you face any challenge face challenge in com composing your story or writing the headline or getting a catchy headline you can you can you can actually you know um you know interact with me and then we'll have that but i'll i'll share the what i want you to do with the creator and she will forward it to you but maybe you may think that probably sometimes our class pages they flood so easily with messages and probably you may not find it so if you feel you can't find it. You can reach me via mail using the isaac.j at myjoinline.com. You can write it down right now if you want to send me a message and I'll share the story with you and then the data with you and then you can start working. Okay, thank you. Solomon, you can go on. Okay, I just wanted to find out if Tomorrow, I think we have another session. So if by tomorrow you'll be able to give us a heads up if there are any internship opportunities available for us at um, the group of companies as in the media house. So sure. as for internship opportunities, it's everywhere dense. But you know, quality is important. So there's a way we streamline application. And so next semester, for instance, next vacation, for instance, that will be a long back. And then you can, you can, you know, turn in your letter and then the team has a way of selecting people, but there are internship opportunities. If you want to join Joy FM, you can join. 
if you want to join, Joy FM and Joy News are actually one. Yes, that you know, one is radio, one is TV. We all work together. If you want to join at Dome, if you want to do local language, you can join at Dome. You can turn in your letter. Yeah, but there are there are there are internship opportunities. As for national service, this year we've already done the interviews for those who will join the research desk. So maybe unless next year, but for internship, I know there are opportunities. And then people like you or people like your, your good self who have math, statistics, and economics background or any other background, but you're still interested in doing data journalism, you're highly welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Please, any more questions? Okay, I think that's all. So I'll call on Michael to give us the root of things and Pascal give us the closing prayer. Michael. Oh, I think Michael.